Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Meet the 2021 Candidates for New York City Mayor. My name is Kathleen Colhane. I'm the president of Non-Traditional Employment for Women, or NEW, and the board chair of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. And this morning, we have the pleasure. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. We have the pleasure of sitting down with Carlos Menchaca for the ninth of our scheduled conversations with the publicly announced candidates. Thank you to the members and partners that have joined us to hear from the candidate. NYCETC supports the workforce development community to ensure that every New Yorker has the access to the skills, training, and education needed to thrive in the local economy. Also that every business is able to maintain a highly skilled workforce. Our membership is composed of nearly now 190 workforce providers, education institutions and labor management organizations that provide job training and employment services to nearly 600,000 New Yorkers, making us the largest city-based workforce development coalition in the country. Thank you again for being here with us this morning. And it's now my pleasure to hand it over to our CEO, Jose Ortiz Jr. to begin the program. Thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jose Ortiz Jr. and I'm the CEO of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. It's great to be here with you all. Before we get started, all participants should know that you'd be muted for the duration of this webinar. Carlos Menchaca will be providing an opportunity to talk to us about his candidacy and answer some questions in the fireside format. We'll then open it up for a few questions from several members and partners. Please type in your questions along with your name, title, and organization throughout the conversation using the chat icon located on the bottom panel. If you're called upon to ask your question, we will unmute you so you may ask your question directly to the council member. Please note that we will try our best to get to as many questions as time will allow. I want to thank Council Member Menchaca for his leadership and for being here with us this morning. For some background on Mr. Menchaca, Carlos lives in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and is a native of El Paso, Texas. He earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of San Francisco and has lived in New York City since 2004. Menchaca's, Menchaca's career spans various roles in public services, including working with the Brooklyn Borough President's Office and serving as a liaison to the LGBT and HIV and AIDS community for the Office of the Speaker in New York City Council. Elected to the City Council in 2013, Menchaca currently represents District 38, which includes Sunset Park, Red Hook, Greenwood Heights, and portions of Borough Park, Dyker Heights, and Windsor Terrace. He is New York State's first Mexican-American elected official and Brooklyn's first openly gay office holder. During his tenure in the Council, he has served as Chair of the Immigration Committee, authored over 80 pieces of legislation of which 24 have been approved and has co-sponsored 625 legislative items of which 277 have been approved. In October, Menchaca launched his campaign to run for mayor of New York City in the 2021 mayoral election. Council members, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. It's good to see you. Thank you and buenos dias a todos. Thank you, Jose. I wanna begin by allowing for you to expand on your introduction and tell us about yourself, your, your career service, anything that, uh, that you'd like to share with our community. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the introduction just reminds me of my hometown of El Paso, a border town, a border town you've probably all been hearing about um, both on the immigration issues and then the, the big shooting that happened. Um, it, was, it was a moment for us all to reflect as a country but that is where I built my values uh, in this border town, growing up in public housing, a single mom, seven kids she raised. Um, I am the first in my family to go to college and graduate. And now I'm here in New York City doing the good work and embedded in communities that uh, are sharing the same experience that I'd, I had uh, as, a, as a kid. Uh, what I'll also share with you is that uh, when I went to college, I was first a physics and engineering uh, student, and then I got involved in politics. And so I added a politics degree, and then I was doing theater this whole time. I've been doing theater since 
middle school and became a performing arts major. So I, it's, I spent five years in college uh, graduating and um, and it just really kind of shows the the multiple spaces and faces that I, I bring to the conversations that I'm a part of, uh, because at the end of the day, I'm an organizer. I came to New York and became uh, really embedded in communities when thinking about uh, when I was at the borough president's office, capital improvements, I managed his capital budget for five years, understanding how the city bonds dollars uh, and brings improvements to communities. Uh, and then I kept organizing with the LGBT community and became uh, a, uh, for the speaker, uh, a citywide organizer and found that so many communities in the LGBT community that were not white were not in these discussions. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about how people needed to be involved in positions of power. And, um, and then I ran for office. And that was really because of what I saw when government failed Red Hook and rode my bike around Red Hook and saw the devastation and just saw government fail. And I said, we can't allow for uh, a council member to be um, uh, unchallenged. And the community rose up and I, in nine months, we formed an incredible coalition and I became council member. And so that is, that is the spirit of my heart, of my values in representation of people who just are not part of the conversations. And, and I hope that we can talk about how you all feel as an incredible um, and large uh, spanning coalition that has been trying to get into government. Uh, now is the time. And I will be that mayor to not just invite you, but to co-govern with a government that is ready for transformation. Uh, that's what I'm right. That's why I'm running for, for uh, mayor. Uh, and that's why I want to be your voice. Thank you for that. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, as mentioned earlier, you officially launched your campaign in October 2020. Um, however, we're closing in on almost a year since the world changed, in, including our city, um, in ways that we couldn't have uh, previously foreseen. Um, and I'm speaking, obviously, specifically to the health and economic uh, devastation and toll of the COVID-19. Uh, but of course, uh, in the last spring as well, what we experienced in terms of social and economic justice movements that had resurged. Uh, across the nation, across the globe, and, and again, especially in our city. How did these two moments play into your decision to jump into the race, and what is their impact on your agenda? It had everything to do with why I'm running and why I'm running now. Uh, being a council member for the last seven years was a uh, was an education in of, of itself. I think that part of what I was able to do as a city council member and really as a mini mayor of a district with incredible need that just had no voice in government, we were able to change the relationship with government by bringing an intense civic engagement plan that looked like a lot of things. Uh, participatory budgeting was one way it demonstrated itself. Land use, uh, we we built a, a, a real on the ground community community led operation that sent industry city packing they they bowed out of this ulerp that they were working on for seven years because we did the homework uh and so this is what i've been working on for the last seven years and i've learned so much about what that looks like the covid moment that pandemic changed the city changed me uh really radicalized me in this opportunity in this um, understanding of the opportunity that we have here in this city to make changes now is the time and I saw government uh, essentially move into crisis and stop everything. It stopped Euler. When have we ever seen Euler just pause? Uh, that means that we can do that. We can actually do things that remove the red tape from the things that are keeping us in small businesses um, or worker cooperatives or day laborers or deliveristas from getting justice. And so that is what I see right now. And being in government, I know that even some of my colleagues have um, uh, lost their sheen of progressive, uh, and this is what happens, the progressive uh, heart uh, just gets weaker over time. And I hope you've seen me just get stronger. Uh, and that is because I'm embedded in community, that I'm an organizer. That's what, that's what I'm gonna bring to this office uh, and to co-govern with experts like all of you to ensure that we're on the right track. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to go a little bit deeper into COVID specifically, and obviously the harsh impact it's had on our city. Um, and I'm conscious of, of this question in part because 
we, as you know, we've gone, uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time with the uh, candidates over the last uh, uh, many months. Um, and, and we've seen this number, which is at one point at the height of the job losses, 1.25 million New Yorkers face unemployment uh, and economic insecurity. Um, the specifics are 892,000 private sector and government jobs were lost at the height. 330,000 independent contractors filed for pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, now, as of January, the unemployment rate stood at 11.4%, with marginalized communities facing the highest rates of displacement. Uh, but this is compared to 8.2% in the rest of the state and 6.7% nationally. Um, now, while this is far from the highs that we experienced last spring, this is not positive uh, for our city. And, and obviously, you know, the particular communities that, that we serve within the, our membership, that you serve within your district, have been hard, hit hard um, during this particular time. So how do you plan to address the significantly higher toll the pandemic has had on our city's workers and businesses? So much of what you just read is um, a reflection of what was already there. These inequities were already there. And, and in coalition, we've been trying to do a lot for these communities. I'm talking about immigrant communities, low-income workers, workers that are often robbed of their wages and um, or don't have access to healthcare. Uh, and so what you saw was the bottom of this economy uh, fall. And the inequities that we've seen, COVID just made it made it more, more um, blatant, uh, which is also the call to action for all of us to say, how do we, how do we fix it? Um, the report that you've all put together is not only comprehensive, but it's exactly what we need to do to think about how we build ecosystems of, and, and not just ecosystems, but bring it back to the neighborhood to ensure that neighborhoods have access to job opportunities, to adult education. These are the things that we've been working on in the city council, uh, really to the incredible opposition from the mayor on how, how to really utilize public funds for public good uh, and really uh, connecting communities that just have not had access. Uh, I'm thinking about some of the initiatives that we've done in the city council to bring more worker cooperative uh, creations of more worker cooperatives, um, thinking about day laborers and their health and safety uh, through creating paradigms that allow for everyone to have what they need, no matter if they're a union worker or non-union worker. Uh, and so I think what, what is most important about this question is that this is the opportunity to make to make that happen. But I have to remind everybody, we're still in a pandemic. Uh, and so vaccines are gonna get be hard to get out to communities. That, that needs to be our focus. But at the same time, we can actually be restructuring how our economy works because the businesses that have, have folded um, need to be transformed as well. Uh, so many of the of the protections just were not there. Uh, and a lot of it was, to be honest, from my vantage point as the immigration chair, was uh, an issue of access through language. Uh, people just didn't know their rights. Uh, and now, you know, we've been able to, as organizations and uh, um, government leaders, been able to connect to some of the most vulnerable. But there's a whole new group of vulnerable families that are going hungry because they've never had to interact with an organization. They've never had to interact with a government official before. And so there is a big gap of moment, a moment where someone, a family says, I need help. Uh, and we're, 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 we're picking up the phone in, in my council office and hearing from people and saying, uh, I don't even know how to access government or resources in our neighborhoods. And, and that, that's, that's a, a massive crisis. And so um, I'm thinking about the mutual aid uh, organizations and how we can actually embed ourselves in that work to get all the good information about the programs that we're gonna be creating together. Uh, and so that's how, I'm again, this is, this is how I'm thinking about it as an organizer and the experts are on the ground and, um, and uh, that's how I'm thinking about it. That's great. You know, I appreciate that that, uh, that color. And, and obviously, you mentioned uh, the specific report that you mentioned was our recovery for all plan, which was a, a vision of recommendations that we set uh, spearheaded in partnership with 80 leaders across 70 different organizations that were part of the workforce development sector, but also small business, think tanks, research institutions, uh, and of course, universities uh, and other human service organizations. So appreciate you mentioning some of those recommendations. And uh, and we look forward to seeing more on that. Um, also, I, I want to just make reference to you know a particular 
uh, uh, project that we've, we are currently working on. And this was launched in November in partnership with our friends at the Association for Neighborhood Housing and Development, or NHD, and the Regional Plan Association, RPA. Um, and with our partnership, we announced the creation of the New York City Inclusive Growth Initiative, which is a two-year plan to uh, um, select a steering committee, which we did so recently, um, that is also going to develop an agenda that's focused on adding good jobs, retaining and expanding affordable housing, and driving the economy forward with more uh, of an inclusive mindset and ensuring that structural inequities are addressed, uh, as well as increasing opportunity and access for all here in our city. Um, so um, when you hear about inclusive growth, um, tell us what that means to you. And I think you've expanded a little bit on that before, but I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about that. And when thinking about that, uh, uh, specific questions uh, um, you know, that are, are raised are, where do you see the role of community voices in crafting an agenda uh, for the future of, city, of New York City's economic growth? What does workforce development specifically play in that? Uh, and, uh, and also just thinking about some of the challenges that New York City workers and job seekers are facing today, um, what policies and programs can we enact to address them? So I'll, I'll go back to the first one again. What's the role of community voices in that, in that discussion? The role of community voices are, are not just integral into the next chapter, it's gonna actually tell us how we're gonna, we're gonna bounce back. Um, people are talking about going back to normal all the time and they experience it in things like, I, wanted, I just wanna go to a restaurant or I just wanna uh, live my life. I wanna be able to get on a subway and go to work. Um, I think we need to confront everyone's idea about what normal was and let people know that we have to actually change as a society. And, and that, that is a massive project nationally, but in the city of New York, we can do that neighborhood by neighborhood to ensure that we're actually bringing equity uh, as we rebuild this economy, which is not what it had before. Wall Street really controlled through real estate interests, how the city grew, how the city built jobs. Uh, we just passed this landmark bill in the council and it took us, it, it took, in my time, seven years uh, with the street vendors to rethink the permitting process, to change the permit itself, to bring more justice to, uh, to immigrant, where ma many of them immigrant workers. That took seven years. There was incredible lobbying against this from brick and mortars uh, who just don't understand the new ecosystem that can actually talk about the symbiotic nature of a street vendor outside a brick and mortar store. So those are the things that we're confronting. It's based out of fear. Uh, and which is why I love, I love this initiative uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that it really centers the lived experience and how you're going to shape the, the ideas and the proposals. Lived, lived experience is something that I understand so um, viscerally because it is in these rooms of government where I have been, where I know that folks did not ever um, understand what it is to live in public housing, uh, to have an immigrant family, to have seen the deportation machine impact you um, or, uh, or, or a family member. Um, that is what needs to be key in these rooms where we make decisions. Uh, and then the other piece is ensuring that when we think about civic influence, uh, we think about how how we bring those voices. And, and I think that, that that's been very clear in how I've been able to uh, really launch into participatory democracy through PB. Uh, more people voted in our participatory budgeting uh, in non-English language ba uh, ballots in in my in my district, and we had the highest vote count across the entire city. And I think that that's folks who don't understand that what I just said, they don't understand what civic influence on, means means to a community. Uh, the the learning that people uh, have at the end of an experience like that to have power, to be able to call the SCA, to be able to call the DOT and say, I wanna, I wanna fix this street. How do we make that happen? Uh, that's, that's Sunset Park. In seven years, we've been able to transform that. Industry City, we've been able to uh, really sh reshape what ULERP can be uh, by demanding a lot more from the city of New York and from, uh, from developers. That's civic influence. That's a co-governing model that I've been developing uh, in real time as a council member, which what I wanna do is bring that kind of leadership citywide uh, through the power of the mayor's office. Uh, and so this is this is not only important to me, but um, it's going to allow us to prioritize the issues that we need to, because I have to say, even even as mayor, with this with this um, very activist mindset, an organizer mindset, we're going to still need all the power we can to confront 
um, the, the white supremacy that we are seeing in our NYPD, in the Department of Education, in all the institutions that govern, um, the, that will govern the ideas that you all come up with. Uh, and so even then I'm gonna need your help and support to ensure that, that we stay focused uh, and that we actually start literally breaking the bones of the government uh, and ensuring that the resources go to COVID impacted communities that for a long time have been defunded and disinvested. And I want to talk a little bit about the second part of that question as well now, because uh, obviously, you, you know, our association is primarily focused on job training and workforce development. So what role do you see workforce development playing in the community at large uh, and, and specifically in, in when thinking about creating a more inclusive New York? Well, so this is so workforce um, is the pipeline and the fuel to to opportunity. If, and we haven't gotten that we haven't, we haven't gotten that right uh, in, in the city of New York. Uh, everything from unions who are, you know, have and struggle through this idea of opening up their shops, um, I think are beginning to see the political um, changes in the wind, that their connection to Rebney does not work. Uh, Industry City really allowed me to have different conversations with the unions and say, how about you start partnering up with communities so that you can start so that the first time that, that they see you is not at a Euler peering um, in favor of this big project that community has been seen as, as, as a displacement project. Start working with them. Uh, we're looking at PLAs right now, the project labor agreements uh, with the city of New York. And there's some recent a movement on that that allows for us to think through how we work with nonprofits who have relationships with young people uh, and underemployed low income workers that you are all uh, getting ready for the workforce to be able to get into uh, into union union shops. Uh, those are the kind of things that I think need to happen in a big way. Uh, and that won't happen unless the, the mayor of New York and all the city agencies really realign and bring resources to all of you who are doing that work on the ground. This is this has just not been a priority for, for this administration. Um, and I think that back to language access, so much of this has been a language access issue. And uh, adult literacy is an example of where we have changed the game for so many families and we are funding it at a, at a fraction of what the city used to fund it as. Uh, and with more immigrant, uh, literally just more immigrant lives in the city of New York, this is where we can actually make a big impact. Uh, and I'm worried about adult literacy, to be honest, in this uh, in this next budget and all the things that, or even like SYEP, these are all opportunities that we can give young people to transform their lives, give them the opportunity to understand what a job can, can be uh, and get them into, uh, into a job. So workforce is not just integral, um, you, it needs to be transformed in how we actually prioritize it. Thank you, council member. So a couple more questions before we open it up to a few more from the uh, from our audience members. Um, in addition to the areas that you've covered, what else do you expect to be your priorities over the first 100 days of your administration? So uh, as, a, as a council member, um, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things. One is the the battles that we've had in the city council around funding and legislation and rethinking how we look at contracts, how we how we bring more flexibility to contracts, all of these things have been met with a consistent no at the administration. I think you've seen that too. Um, everything from the work that mocks can do, um, everything that we can do to make contracts flexible in delivering services uh, have just been met with, with flat out no's. I think that we're in crisis. And so for the first 100 days, I want to extend and continue to be in crisis mode until we fix the system and really understand that we that the flexibility is not about about losing transparency or losing um, the uh, the understanding of what public good is, because these are public dollars that we're using. This is about really trusting and co-governing with all of you and the ideas that will come out of the, uh, the, the, the growth initiative, but really kind of thinking through all of that. So that's, that's what I want to do. One, that's just the framework. Second is I want to really empower the city council to do their work. City council members on the ground understand their communities better than anybody else. I want to ensure that those voices are heard in how we think about policy 
and that the, the mayor's office is really an execution of the policy of the people. Um, that has just not been the case. The, the mayor has just stopped us uh, at the council. And so we've been, it, it's been a very um, contentious relationship. And it is where you, and this is my belief, but it's this coalition that has really found a voice in the council. Um, and so I want that to continue to happen. Uh, but I want to ensure that we can move to execution and execute the will of the people uh, from the mayor's office while keeping a balanced budget. Uh, but you know, we've been we've been in movement together for a while. I know that the work that you're all doing is something that needs to be heard and needs to be executed on. And I want to I want to err on that. Thank you for that. And, and our last question before we head into um, into questions from our audience, and we have a few. Um, what lessons have you gained through your public service and career that you would apply uh, to the workforce and economic development issues that we experience here in the city? And, and I know that's a broad question, but how does your vision and approach differ from the current administration, particularly with regards to issues of economic equity and opportunity? You know, the, the, the thing that, that comes to mind is, is just looking at the immigrant experience in the city of New York so much of what I've seen is how easily an immigrant worker is put to the side by an administration. Uh, they don't have a power to vote, not yet. Uh, we need to get them the power to vote. Uh, that's gonna change the game. But until then, uh, and I hope that happens this year, we can, act, we can just look through the lens of, of an immigrant worker. Immigrant workers were dying on construction sites. Uh, over 500 of them died in the last 10 years. That's an epidemic in and of itself um, that it took a while for um, for the city to come together and say, we got to raise the standards of education and actually fund it. Um, the deliveristas right now who are struggling to get uh, airtime to talk about the issues that as an essential worker, they've been feeding, and so the street vendors have been feeding New York City um, and they get pushed aside uh, and those are the those are the things that I I've learned that power is something that you have to take uh, and and I hope that in the last seven years you've seen me fight uh, saying no even to my colleagues who voted for the jails uh, the four borough jails uh, to creating essentially new cages that were just maybe more new um, but same old thing. Uh, we haven't closed Rikers. We passed a budget that was an austerity budget. A new austerity budget is on its way. That courage that I just have seen people um, uh, fail to reconnect to, I think is, is real. Uh, and part of that is these institutions that we're all trying to change have, have momentum. And so we need new voices in government. We need new ideas. We need people who have been tested. Um, I'm one of three elected officials that have been uh, kept accountable to communities, uh, mm -hmm. communities like mine, immigrant communities, uh, who were never able to vote for me, but I am accountable to them. And so I've shown that. And so this is what I've learned. I've learned that it's, it's not easy to stay, to stay progressive and stay open-minded. Uh, this is why you're going to need to send the fiercest, fiercest heart, uh, values-driven person and leader uh, to make those changes. Thanks, Council Member. Uh, so um, it was really fantastic getting you to open up and, and share your experiences with us and talk more about um, the issues that are pressing within our community and really appreciate your candor with that. Uh, yeah. we're, now, we're now gonna open up to a few questions from some of our members and partners. Uh, and we, uh, just so for participants know, we'll be listing names of, of participants in the order that you'll be asked uh, to ask your question. Uh, and our first question comes from Angie Kamath, uh, who is the uh, University Dean of Continuing Education and Workforce Programs at the City University of New York. Angie, uh, you're up when you're ready. Hi, Angie. Thank you. Hi, nice yeah. to see you. Um, and thanks so much for joining us uh, this morning. Um, Council Member, I would love to hear um, your vision on ways that CUNY could be a really strong partner to city government, to city hall, to communities, to families. Uh, we're such an important economic development asset. Um, and yet I think that it, uh, we are rather undervalued or maybe even misunderstood, frankly, um, uh, in terms of what we can offer. And so I would love to hear your vision for how CUNY could be a really important and even bigger partner in your uh, in, in administration where you're our mayor. Yeah, thank you. CUNY is an institution that needs to be accessible to everyone. This is a free CUNY concept that uh, everyone should be 
uh, excited about and trying to figure out how to make that happen. So one, make it accessible to everyone. Two, um, I talk a lot about a Green New Deal, that a municipal Green New Deal where the city of New York actually funds all of the, the projects that we need that include fully funding NYCHA, uh, thinking about resiliency projects uh, that could be fully funded. And as someone who has spent a lot of time in Red Hook thinking through resiliency, we just have not gotten that capital investment from the federal government or from the city. So the city needs to make that make that investment first uh, and not wait for the state and not wait for the federal government. We can do that here by bonding the appropriate amount of, of money. And I'm thinking we can do $100 billion in the next four years. But how are we going to get everybody trained? Through CUNY. Um, and I think we can actually start thinking about CUNY and, and building more CUNY satellite offices in spaces like Sunset Park um, that don't have immediate access to education. If we think about how education has worked in the past, we can really, we can really access places like union and non-union um, training centers uh, to include, and this is one of those ideas that has not gotten um, anywhere is allowing for the day laborers to go and use the union shops to do their OSHA trainings, to do just like any kind of trainings. Uh, and that just hasn't happened. Uh, a mayor could actually make it, um, uh, make it a, um, a desirable with some incentives. Uh, so, so CUNY plays a, a big role. Uh, and again, the, ex the accessibility of CUNY can change if we think through education and allow CUNY to expand into neighborhoods that can need it. Um, and so anyway, CUNY is big, free, we need to make it free. Thanks council member. And thanks Angie for the question. Our next question is from Darlie Cornelio, who's the education director at the Consortium for Workers Education. Oh, or Hi, Darlie. UA. Thanks Darlie. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member, for being here. And thank you for the constant support that you provide to CWE. It's really remarkable. We are lucky to have you on our side. Um, as I hear you talk about the inequality in the city, and obviously after the pandemic, this had just been exacerbated, it also reminds me a lot of oh, our current mayor first time running in a Delo 2 city. And we were all very excited about it. Um, in my personal opinion, nothing materialized in terms of that tell to city, we continue to see inequality just going, uh, going bigger in the city. So are you concerned of how this might seem to voters that, wow, here we go again, the same story, no action. And how do you plan to actually set clear action that might show to voters and New Yorkers that you mean change, that you mean action? Darlie, so thank you for that, that question, because I think what we didn't do in 2013 is our homework. We didn't look at what he did as council member. He, he pushed a rezoning in, uh, in Park Slope Gowanus that uh, just left a lot of people behind. There, there's so much that, that we can learn from people who have been elected and have made decisions in moments of, of crisis, in moments that were, were hard. And those compromises happen. You have elected officials that supported Hudson Yards uh, running for mayor right now, who are saying a lot of great things. But when you look at records, um, the, the best record is when you're an elected official and you have to make a decision and you're in a room with the colleagues who are saying, you gotta do this for us, or you gotta do that, or, or getting pulled by developers and revenue because they're the ones that are funding your campaign. You might not be taking the money today, but you were before. That's what you have to look at. And you can look at my record and my record stands strong. I've been sitting and spending time with, with immigrant New Yorkers, with workers, uh, understanding their issues, taking stances on their behalf uh, that were not popular, that um, have, have been incredibly politically um, alienating for me in a lot of ways. Uh, and I'm I took all those because that's a values-driven leadership style um, that you can see. Uh, Industry City was another moment where even my colleagues came out and said that they're going to support Industry City when I said no. Uh, even though I showed them the homework, this wasn't just a member deference conversation. This was about doing the homework about what the actual impacts were going to be and why this was the right thing, even though they said that jobs were going to be at stake. This isn't just about a jobs question. It's about how you build those jobs for equity. And I stood strong. Um, and so that's, that's what we have to do. We have to look at how, 
how people have been tested by these institutions of power. Thank you, council member. Uh, you. We now have a couple additional questions, uh, but they're gonna be asked uh, directly to you by our uh, uh, vice president of policy and special initiatives, Andy Garniva. Okay. You got uh, it. Because uh, we actually Andy. need an audio issue. So Andy's gonna ask for it. Okay, you got it. Hello. Uh, uh, so this uh, next few questions come from Jesse Solomon, who's the deputy director of SBIDC, South Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Um, Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Her mic isn't working at the moment, so on her behalf. Uh, so some of the questions are, what would you do to shore up the boundaries of the industrial business zone and promote job growth in the manufacturing sector? If elected, who would you appoint to the BSA and the CPC in order to ensure the success of your equitable economic development policies? And lastly, and this is a pretty close one to all of our heart, what reforms would you put in place for the Workforce One system? So industrial zones, workforce yeah, system. Yeah, um, IBZs. I've been fighting for IBZs since the beginning of, of my time. How do we strengthen them? Uh, one, I love your ideas on how to make that happen. But one, um, we got to commit to zoning protections in IBZs. That hasn't happened. That has slowly uh, been uh, deteriorated by the Department of City Planning. And so we got we to gotta make, make that um, make that real and, and hold the promises to remove housing from uh, any kind of housing possibilities or hotels, special permits um, are examples of how we can fortify the industrial business zones. I think we're already now forgetting that it was the industrial business zones that produced so much PPE during this pandemic. Uh, people are already forgetting that as as we get closer to things like the Gowanus, um, the Gowanus, um rezoning uh and 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 so so i will hold that i that's just something that that's my track record i will continue to hold that but we also have to bring more more resources to um, organizations like sbidc that are organizing the manufacturing businesses to ensure that they have what they need to bring that workforce um and there's some really amazing ideas that are happening in red hook right now that can connect nitro residents to jobs um, and and with all the money that I think is on its way, both from the city through a Green New Deal, people, I'm not the only one talking about it, we're going to need SBIDC and other workforce development organizations to be ready and robust to be able to do that training and to have no at language access issues. Um, and so, so we need we need more funding to the industrial service providers, industrial business service providers. Um, yeah, I hope I hope. You, you know that I'm a champion now and I'm gonna to continue to be a champion tomorrow. Um, I think the other, let me just say something about zoning. I think we're having an issue right now with last mile delivery. That's just kind of run amok. Um, and that's a problem, even though it has jobs. I think this is an interesting uh, concept because, because it's gonna it's going to choke in a lot of ways, communities that have uh, a kind of mixed use uh, I would love for an SBIDC to lead uh, an immediate kind of pause on a um, in a rethinking of how we how we permit uh, 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 job intensive uh, opportunities like that. But we should be giving leadership to organizations like SBIDC to make more of those changes and fund them. Agree more. Um, and then the question on uh, how you would reform or um, what kind of changes you would make for the Workforce One system. Oh, the Workforce One system. So I know okay. I gave you a multi, multiple yeah. questions. Uh, you understand? Very quick. I think that it just, it's a hit or miss with Workforce One centers. I, I, I'm a big critic of them um, in general. Um, but it's not because of them. I think it's it's how we structure these contracts. Uh, the contracts are kind of geared around around job placement, but there's not a lot of money to do uh, check-ins with people who have maybe lost their way. Um, they may they may never come back to the workforce one center if they had a, a negative experience because the job where they're at just didn't fit. And so there needs to be a rethinking and bringing in a more um, so so. Um, social worker approach to following people through uh, a job, but the contract is just not built for that. Uh, this is very kind of Bloomberg style where get a job, we made you made the mark and, and that just, it's like teaching to the test, it doesn't work. 
uh, and I'd be open to your ideas on how to make that different. Thank you, Council Member. And, and our next question is, uh, Annie's going to ask on behalf of Wayne Ho, uh, who is a board member and the president hey, of the Chinese American Planning Council. Um, so Wayne has been very consistent in asking this question of every single candidate. Uh, New York City contracts are out $4 billion per year to human services providers. Providers continue to face many issues, including not getting paid the full cost of providing services, late payments, low wages for staff, etc. What are your plans to support the human services sector? Wayne, tell me what we need to do and let's do it. Um, but here's my first my first attack at that. Uh, one, these contracts are are not uh, well resourced, but they're also they're, you're not getting you're not getting um, reimbursed at at adequate times. So you should be getting the money up front to be able to do the work. There's a lot of cash flow issues with these contracts. Um, there needs, needs to be a lot of flexibility and the recovery for all plan really kind of speaks to the idea of removing red tape, allowing you all to make changes along the way. Um, I think that's, that's where we are. There's, there's, there needs to be like an experimentation of how you execute uh, goals on the ground. And I think that if we, can, if we can understand value and we understand your work already over time, if we know who you are as an organization, you should be able to to take that that freedom and and and, and create the the access for for workforce um, and 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 jobs and people. So I think I think that needs to happen, and I think we can do that. Um, and this is all part of this kind of first hundred days of, of of really keeping to a crisis. The crisis of the pandemic may be lifted after we get to vaccinations, but the crisis of the pandemic and the economy and the things that we need to do in the economy need to stay in place. Um, so, uh, and back to Darlie's question, I think you just need to, you, you need to choose a mayor that you believe will have your interest at heart and will believe in you in making the opportunities um, and the flexibility to create those opportunities happen. Uh, and I hope that you can believe me in that. Thank you. Uh, and I appreciate you addressing that because obviously Darlie asked another question inside the chat. Um, um, so we wanted to just quickly raise that last question before we actually close out for uh, the day. Um, um, and that is, that, you know, there's a powerful PLA with the building trades that really needs the support of legislators in Albany uh, um, that would open the door to union jobs and, and New Yorkers. How do you plan to work with Albany legislators to move that forward? And I think just broadly thinking about the work that needs to happen at the state level as well. How do you plan to work with the state in in, uh, in your role as New York City Mayor? Well, it's no it's no um, secret that I'm a big critic of the governor. Uh, I think the governor has failed on many attempts, and like many of the old leadership, um, and. Lived experience is where, you know, um, in so many ways, at one point we had um, the same kind of representation at the federal, state, and city. Uh, and actually we still do right now. Um, and these are, these are folks that compromise because they're just, they don't have that lived experience. So put the, put the governor aside. Um, he's going through a, a big re review on his um, crisis in, in his leadership around uh, uh, senior centers. What, um, I guess what I wanna say is this, there's new power in Albany. The state is now led by a um, super majority uh, that was elected by a group of people that are gonna continue to elect people who are gonna, are gonna make right in, in Albany. We are a creature of the state as a city of New York. We have to ask for a lot of permission working with the state senators and the assembly members to make that happen and then bring in our congressional team. Uh, I want them to get involved. That worked for us in, uh, in our battle against Industry City. We, we brought them on board. We kept them um, abreast of all the things that were happening. So when we needed to make a move, uh, we, everybody understood where we were at. That's transparency. Uh, and we want, we want to be able to do that with the, the state, the, the new state leadership. Uh, and I think they're ready to make that happen. Uh, so we need to keep them accountable as well. Uh, and I think this is where the electorate is changing. And and so and so is so is Cuomo. Um, he's beginning to understand that that his leadership is at stake here. 
Uh, and I, so I, I see a lot of changes, but really where it needs to happen is the organizing on the ground, organizing, organizing works. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been all been doing that work. And so I want to, I want to keep uh, encouraging that and supporting that and, uh, and then reflecting that in the, the mayor's office uh, for policy and, um, and advocacy in Albany. And we actually have one last question uh, from Angie and Annie, excuse me, Annie, my colleague is going to be asking a question with regards to the Green New Deal. So in reflection to your uh, lovely backboard, I uh, kind of wanted to connect the two pieces around BLM and Green New Deal. I wanted to learn more about how you plan on um, A, making sure that workforce is a major component of any Green New Deal or kind of climate and sustainability efforts from an infrastructure and resiliency perspective, as well as uh, you know, the connection that you see between the issues raised by Black Lives Matter and making sure that um, things like Green New Deal and climate infrastructure projects are equitable and inclusive. Well, you, I think the, the answer was in the, in the question, we have to ensure that we make every investment uh, an investment for our communities that have been impacted by, by COVID. Uh, COVID impacted communities are BIPOC communities. They're communities that have seen a disinvestment of education facilities uh, in our schools. Uh, they have seen a higher investment of police and incarceration. Uh, these are places where you have metal detectors in our schools. Um, these are places that are uh, uh, many public housing uh, communities that have seen disinvestment. So when we can begin to invest in communities, um, like our NYCHA communities and fully invest in them and start transforming people's lives, we can actually start seeing a better opportunity for, for work. Um, I think that a lot of the things that we've been doing in Sunset Park and Red Hook is ensuring that our, our most vulnerable communities get access to, uh, to economic opportunities. And again, this is where I keep coming back to language access. If we can actually remove that from everything, our immigrant communities can actually see that government listens to them hears them and sees them. Um, that, that needs to happen across the, across the board. I would wanna co-govern with you around how we actually build, a, and this is partly the inclusive growth initiative, an opportunity for us to kind of listen to see how you will make that um, a, a kind of understood uh, component of, of this. Um, I'm not an expert on everything. I think what, you, what you're what you hearing today is that you have my, my values understood, my track record of standing up to anyone who does not have and share the same values that we do and um, and ensuring that we can actually get, get stuff done. Um, that's, that's, my, that's my style, that's my leadership. And, and I'm gonna continue to do that as an executive at the, at the mayor's office. Um, the thing that the mayor has around them is a team of people who can actually execute on the items. Uh, what we need is someone to manage the values that they don't separate from, that they don't deviate from. And there are powerful interests in this city that do not want the things that we just talked about today and that you're going you're gonna to continue to champion in the city, in the city of New York. Um, I'm kind of done with that. I'm done with, with, with seeing so much getting pushed to the side because there are profits to be made. Concepts like the public bank, for example, won't happen unless someone actually says, we're gonna make it happen because it will remove power from other interests that do not want that. Other foreign um, international interests that come in and fund things like, like development projects. And so um, this, is, this is, I think this is what we need. And this is something that I think we're gonna, we're gonna be able to do together uh, in a co-governing model way. Thank you, Council Member. And thank you for the thoughtful responses to, to uh, a wide range of questions today. Yeah, thank uh, you. And we really uh, appreciate um, your role in addressing some of these critical issues uh, for our community and for the entirety of the workforce development sector. Uh, well, uh, mm -hmm. I want to just give you a couple of seconds or minutes to provide anything else that you want to share with us in, in a closing statement. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm just so thankful I get to talk to you. Uh, you all uh, who have seen our leadership in action, when we can partner together, we've done some incredible work. Uh, and that's just as a council member, a council member with the power to vote, uh, both on a budget and legislation. Imagine if we were working together 
uh, in the mayor's office, where we can actually restructure how government works uh, in a way that you know I will stand all the way to the end with you. Um, that is something that I'm committed to doing uh, as mayor. And in the first 100 days, I wanna ensure that we work with the city council that can get legislation done, that can get budgets done um, to participate uh, or to have people participate that have never participated in government before. Uh, that, that's the power that I have seen has been more powerful than anything else, has been more powerful than some of the special interests and corporations that um, sometimes we feel like there's no other opportunity than just to work with them. Uh, we gotta change that. COVID has changed me, COVID has changed you, COVID has changed this city. Uh, and I think that the thing that we can honor the most is to bring a leader that can reflect that change and, and make that happen. We'll have four years uh, to prove that and then we'll maybe have another four years to make that happen. But I think this is the moment to take a leap to bring someone in that has that lived experience um, and the receipts uh, on how, how um, to confront power because that's what this is all about. These ideas are great. And a lot of candidates are talking about the same things now. We're all kind of moving towards a very simple, uh, a similar platform. Um, the question is, are, do you believe them? Do you believe that they're gonna actually make that change and make it happen? Um, my track record uh, speaks for itself and open to talk to you. You can DM me on Twitter, Instagram, and let's keep the conversation going. Thanks, Councilman, and thank you for offering that. It's obviously incredibly important to uh, for any leader to be accessible, and we we appreciate that of you, and, uh, and obviously encourage our, our members and partners to do so. That concludes the ninth of our conversations with the 2021 candidates for New York City Mayor. Stay tuned for additional announcements in the coming weeks. Thank you all for joining us, and of course, I want to thank you, Council Member, once again for. Uh, being here for your leadership, for your willingness to sit with uh, our community, and we wish you the best of luck with your candidacy. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And, enjoy, uh, the day. enjoy the day.